Hey guys, so it's time for the next episode of the mini series I call A New Heart for My Smart Home. In this episode, we will be migrating um, Home Assistant from Docker based installation to um, complete installation, including Home Assistant operating system and Node Red and whatnot. And uh, also, in the meantime, I will show you the MQTT broker I use. And well, the broker that literally nobody else uses. At least none of my friends, none of m people I know. So that's an interesting story, interesting uh, broker. And ultimately, I will ask you the question whether would you use it or not. Anyway, let's continue with today's video. But first, if you're new to the channel, my name is Laszlo Marza, and this channel deals with home automation, home networking, and occasionally with related stuff like DIY electronics and even a little bit of 3D printing. As usual, I'm starting the video in the series with a Proxmox screen. Don't worry, this time we won't have to deal with Proxmox that much, but I wanted to show you something. So the board or the system used to have 4 gigs of RAM, but uh, for a very small price I just bought another 4 gigs for, yeah, to have more memory for the Docker containers. IP Fire and Pyho, I haven't touched the, um, those much but uh, in case of the docker host uh, there's been uh, some improvements and some additional containers so first of all I increased the mem memory provided for this uh, VM because well now I have more memory and then I've migrated two of the last uh, components from the old server to this new one so one is MQTT host that should be available for all the devices in the house which means I had to uh, add it here to this docker host which is not behind the firewall I mean not behind the internal firewall and accessible for pretty much all the network my choice for an MQTT uh, broker is EMQX and uh, this is the broker surprisingly a lot of people don't even know about right now don't care about the stats it's uh, not under load yet so I just installed it uh, you can conveniently install it via docker docker compose port in or whatever your tool of choice is point is I really love EMQX because uh, besides it's a free software it uh, has a very low memory footprint uh, compared to what it can offer you so this amount of memory this is uh, much higher than for example what mosquito uses but still uh, as you will see i uh, want to show you a few of the features like having a rule engine and uh, being able to cluster it without uh, uh, another software component like a load balancer or a proxy or whatever and of course for me the most important part is this dashboard why? Because uh, when you are debugging your smart home or your IoT applications or whatever, having a clean overview helps a lot. And uh, this is what the EMQUX is really good at. I mean, with this dashboard. So you can see information about the connected clients, uh, about the running topics. Um, okay, just uh, let me show you this for the existing installation because right now, as I mentioned, this is the new one. So I pretty much have the same still running on the old server on a different IP and there we go so you can see there's a lot more here different topics clients subscriptions and then there are different um, uh, capabilities of EMQX I haven't even tried like the rule engine uh, as far as I understand, this rule engine uh, can be used to trigger various uh, actions based on contents of messages, but uh, take it with a grain of salt, I never really used it. Also, EMQX has a thinned down version, which comes without the dashboard and without some plugins, and it's called EMQX Edge, that is for really low power devices, think something like Raspberry Pi Zero or whatever. So anyway, 
Uh, I've been using EMQX for years now and I will continue to use it and that will be the broker for the new system as well. Another component that I decided that I need to migrate away from the old server is Tasmo Admin. So Tasmo Admin is an interface for managing a group of uh, Tasmota firmware power devices like Sonoff Basics or your custom microcontrollers. As you can see I have a few lights and some multi-sensors that I've uh, self-made so those are running on uh, Diva Minis I think or some other uh, ESP8266 based devices. So point is I want to have the whole uh, thing moved away from this old server to the new one. For that I'm lucky. Uh, Task admin doesn't really need data migration so I didn't, don't really want to waste time in the video with installing Task admin because you can conveniently install it via docker it's just a matter of few lines of docker compose uh, configuration for me and now I have up and running so here we go but it's empty thing is uh, it has this feature called auto scan which can scan and add your uh, Tasmota devices from the local network. So let's just do that. Uh, you provide the start IP and end IP. End IP is exclusive, so means that I provided 255 and it will scan IPs up to 254. Also, requirement is that uh, the username and password uh, will have to be uh, the same for the devices or or it will actually add uh, will ask for a username and a password for all devices uh, one by one for me uh, given those are only sensors and light switches having the same password for all the devices is just fine so here we go i'm starting auto scan and uh, this usually takes like three to five minutes to grab all the devices from the network so given that one is offline at the moment, it should find six devices or actually, yeah, six. So let's just wait for this to happen. Also regarding the installation of um, Tesla admin, uh, I decided to hide this behind the firewall. So as you might remember in this uh, configuration, I created with the four Raspberry Pis and the mini ITX your PC, there's uh, a firewall that hides um, the Raspberry Pis from the outside network. And uh, Tesmat, I mean, is just running in Docker in one of those Raspberry Pis. Anyway, uh, the autoscan has finished and uh, interestingly enough, it only found five devices. So just let's take a look. And we are missing the desk light. It is uh, interesting because it's up and running it should be there with this IP whatever okay let's just add what we have devices added and we will just uh, do another sweep we will restrict it to a much smaller range hopefully it will find it again and we can consider this uh, something like an intermittent issue. Okay, now we have it too. I don't know what was the reason. Also, it didn't, uh, it couldn't fill the name. So this was desk light. And here we go. Okay. Now, if I go to the device list, I have all my devices here. And basically this concludes the migration of Tasma admin. Now I can drop the old installation. Great. So finally, I've left the biggest change, Home Assistant itself. Instead of migrating Home Assistant from the previous installation, I decided to rebuild the whole thing from the ground. And that is because uh, the other installation was made with a totally different method. This time I'm using uh, 
Home Assistant operating system on a Raspberry Pi 4, 2 GB model. And uh, with it, it comes a lot of extra features uh, and a lot of uh, extra add-ons and possibilities. The old installation was inside the Docker container and it was quite limited. Also, updating it, uh, I didn't really like the idea of just keep pulling a new version of the container like every second day or something like that. So this time this is the full Home Assistant experience and uh, I'm just discovering a few features already. So for example in this case we have this supervisor because uh, the architecture gets a little bit, little bit more complicated with this kind of installation. Home Assistant has its own operating system. It's running inside a Docker container and a supervisor is like, uh, well, a supervisor application that keeps Home Assistant up to date, keeps it running. And also it provides means for uh, installing add-ons, which are actually also Docker containers. So you can do uh, pretty wild things with it. Just let's show, let me show you an example. So Visual Studio Code add-on for Home Assistant. And uh, yeah, I have it here too. And guess what? This just loads up uh, the, home, the Home Assistant directory uh, from the server. And you can open other directories. And uh, you can do pretty much a lot of things you can normally do with Visual Studio Code, but this whole thing is running inside Home Assistant, so you can just use it to edit your configuration, even to view logs or whatever. So this is pretty neat. Also, with uh, Supervisor, you can uh, use a variety of, vari variety of add-ons coming from this add-on store and you can also use your own add-ons and you can develop your own add-ons so this is uh, quite well documented and uh, there are examples and whatnot and uh, actually after uh, discovering this whole thing I it took me like a day or two to develop my own add-on so this one is uh, an integration for portainer agent into home assistant home assistant actually has an integration for portainer but if you don't want to waste resourcing on hosting the portainer UI and whatnot within home assistant then you can just uh, go with this lightweight uh, solution that having a portainer uh, agent running on the home assistant instance uh, exposing docker towards uh, real portainer installation so let me show you what I'm talking about portainer here this is the, the portainer instance that is running on the mini itx pc that is part of that uh, that uh, server and and that is the primary installation it also connects to a raspberry pi which is an 8 gigabyte model and uh, acts as uh, a docker host this one is running Tasmo admin for example then it can connect to the old server for managing whatever is left there a couple of containers will stay uh, like the media server so it's useful to have it here I can just access all my docker host from this single UI and also with the portainer agent uh, add-on now I have home assistant here so I can manage and take a look around in the home assistants internal uh, container structure logs configurations network settings whatever uh, so this uh, this uh, add-on to work that I developed um, it's it's not really publicly available at the moment it will be on github but right now first I need to issue a pull request for portainer agent because there were like two lines of code that I needed to adjust to make it able to run within uh, home assistant via this uh, add-on type of solution and hopefully, hopefully they will uh, accept that pull request. And after that, I can just open source my portainer agent. And also you will be able to do the same, like pulling portainer agent into Home Assistant. Anyway, as you can see, there's still a lot of going on. I need to reconfigure all my, all my stuff because now I 
lost all the lights, all the switches, status, whatnot. So interesting times ahead for me when it comes to experimenting with Home Assistant and its different integrations and add-ons. And finally, as a wrap-up for this mini-series, this is how the system looks like after installing and configuring all the things. So uh, this is uh, an overview of my home network with not all the devices, but most important parts. We have this uh, AI mesh, Asus AI mesh, mesh Wi-Fi network, which uh, connects pretty much all the wireless devices uh, that include smartphones, whatever. And uh, this is the old server called Vault. And uh, this was the main problem that basically anyone on the Wi-Fi could access this server. It was hidden behind SSH and whatnot, but uh, still I didn't reconsider really it because this Wi-Fi has quite a long range, a lot of devices, some of them are outdoors, and uh, I always wonder what happens if some device gets hacked. And uh, given that this server used to control everything, uh, I didn't feel it like is the right way to do things. So right now we have this new uh, heart, I need to come up with a name for that, uh, which very limited access to the Wi-Fi and instead inside like a self-contained system of uh, one bigger machine that uh, has those VMs with IP fire, Pi hole, and in Docker running Heimdall, MQX, EMQX, Portainer, whatnot. Then behind IP Fire, uh, as an even more secure uh, part, there is the Raspberry Pi. I'm not calling it cluster anymore, but still it's something like a cluster. So it has running Octoprint, Home Assistant, uh, Transmo Admin, and it has some device uh, control software. This is a work in progress solution, but uh, in general, I'm thinking about controlling all the security cameras and, and uh, special devices that uh, I really want to uh, avoid moving to the Wi-Fi. So this will be just connected to one of the Raspberry Pis here. Right now, uh, Vault is uh, repurposed as a media server, so um, it can store family photos and, and whatnot, and um, it will be accessible for a, from a few devices like smart TV, uh, phones, maybe, I don't know, but for example, not from the IoT, IoT devices like the, the sensors and, and uh, switch, uh, smart switches or whatnot. So right now, I consider, it, uh, consider this pretty secure for an average uh, and every smart home and uh, yeah I try to, to uh, separate and and clean up all the not all the unneeded unwanted connection between different devices so for example it can't happen that uh, for whatever reason Amazon Echo has direct connection to my 3d printer or I don't know a smartphone uh, direct connection to a security camera or stuff like that. Anyway, I'm not saying that this whole thing is finished because uh, like every smart home nowadays, this is a constant state of, of uh, evolution and I will continue to tweak uh, stuff. But right now, yeah, this was a big step. So thanks for staying with, staying with me on this journey. And uh, yeah, that's all I wanted to show today. If you have questions like um, about specific details or specific pieces of software I mentioned, then just feel free to use the comments. I'm happy to answer. And yeah, again, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider subscribing. I'm pretty sure I will have some interesting stories for the future as well. So um, with that, I'm closing this video now. Thank you for watching and hope to see you next week, next time, guys, with a new video. Bye. You're still here. That's good, because that means you kind of like my video. If so, feel free to check out these other videos too. And uh, if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. That helps me a lot. And uh, yeah, if you click the bell button, you will get also notified about new videos.